All right. Hey, hello, welcome. My name is Dr. Cheryl Meyer. I'm a psychologist and um, I'm going to be reading a new book, a new book series for my YouTube channel is what I'm intending this for. I'll show you where I am. It, it took us an hour to get here. That's the ocean. I usually pick a beautiful scene and I come out in nature and I read books that are um, free copyright, free domain because, but not just any books. I'm very particular about the books that I read. I've got my little Leia with me, <laughs> Princess Leia. She's just a little hot. It's hot today, but she's good. We, we just got our water. Anyway, um, she ought to have her own channel, right? She's so cute. So, uh, I read the whole book, The Princess and the Curdy. Now, it's important, if you want to know more about fairy stories and about uh, stories such as this, then you can read uh, an essay on fairy stories by J.R.R. Tolkien, you know, the guy that wrote The Lord of the Rings. And you can read... Um, I mean, C.S. Lewis wrote some as in that as well. He wrote one of the essays in that book. And Madeleine L. Ingle, she was not in that book, but she wrote A Wrinkle in Time, if you've heard of her, um, and Many Waters. I took a writing course with her in England, uh, even though she's from New York. But um, she said that the best thing about C.S. Lewis, if you've heard of C.S. Lewis, um, Anthony Hopkins played him in a movie called Shadowlands. And anyway, he wrote the Narnia books, C.S. Lewis did. But she said the best thing about C.S. Lewis is that he introduced her to George MacDonald. And so, um, George MacDonald is a Scottish writer from the 1800s. And um, Madeleine Alingle is talking about this as an adult. It's very important whether you got fairy stories as a child or not, or whether you're letting your children listen to the story. I, I'm making these all uh, child appropriate as best as I can. Um, but these books, these books convey higher meaning. They, this, is, this, this is the reason that I read them. They, they're conveying how to die to your ego self and live to something higher. How if we're called to be kings and priests, or as Mother Teresa said, we're all called to be saints. And um, I think it's St. John said in the book of Revelation um, and, and different places too, that we are, and, 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 and the Torah as well, that we are called to be kings and priests and we have a model before us. And I always welcome people of all religions and I have friends of all religions. And so, uh, this is why fairy stories work so good. And songs, I love songs because, and art, because art can speak to us in symbolic form and it doesn't alienate people. It doesn't have to alienate people. You know, I was friends with this musician named Elliot Smith and he's passed on now, but I keep getting like, it feels like clues from him, from conversations we had, deep conversations we had and just time spent with each other and then songs that he left us there there's like um layers and layers of meaning of consciousness in them and because he's such a beautiful soul you know we all have our problems but he was committed to to his craft and and to consciousness and he did both of those things really well and i felt it when i was with him you know um in the times that we got to spend together but I feel the same in a way with George MacDonald and Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. I feel like, you know, they walk alongside me in my life and um, I don't want to get all emotional, but um, all three of them have helped me through so, so much, you know, sometimes Jane Austen, yes, and um, 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 what's her name that wrote North and South, um, Elizabeth Glasgow, I liked that as well that there's a lot of dying in that. So, but um, there is in life, you know, we go through ups and downs, we go through the ebb and the flow. And so, 
um, the first book was called that I'm just going to get into the book already. The first book was called The Princess and the Goblin, and it's a classic. They used to always have it at the bookstore here in the classic section section. And then, you know, somehow I, I don't know if they took it out of the classics because it was just so profound or people didn't get it. But this this stuff is like gold. What George MacDonald writes us here is is like gold. It's like if you have your holy book, you know, I'll say like the Bible or something, you know, and then you have like 10 other books to, to take you through the rest of your life that can inform you. In my estimation, like having a George MacDonald book is an essential, essential. And I listen to the Lord of the Rings a lot. I love the guy that read that. And so it's just my way of giving back. I'm taking time out to, you know, hike up here. If it was a clearer day, you'd see that's the ocean. It's really pretty. Um, but we'll get the sun and the wilderness out here, the desert. And I have a mic so I can put the my camera wherever. Um, again, my name is Cheryl Meyer, Dr. Cheryl Meyer. I've been a psychologist for over 20 years. And uh, I just care about the cultivation of people's lives, your inner life, the work that you do in your inner life. And I always want to make it fun. And so when we read fairy stories, it's fun because we're entering in the story, but we have someone that guides us and helps us through these, these experiences in life where you can lose faith and then get it again and be courageous and face everything you're called to face. And you are called to face high things. And instead of hiding out behind like TV shows or something, and there's art in some of those too, but you know, I encourage you just, yeah, oh, look at this hawk. Look at this. Whoa. You're not taking mine, mister. <laughs> Maybe he's looking for Leia. She's so cute. Um, she's a little, she's a little one. I'll protect her. Um, huh, see, just as I was saying, we have to be heroes. You know, if I hadn't had difficult times in life, then I wouldn't stand up to that hawk. That hawk was big, you know? I would be scared of it. Wow. Um, that's good to know. There's a trolley that just came up here. So now I know I can walk here and take the trolley down to the beach. Maybe we'll, we'll get some, some readings of this on the beach. Um, so I'll start. But uh, if you haven't subscribed to my channel, subscribe to my channel already and um, hit the notification bell so you get notified when new videos come out and look for this series. I read a book called The New Man, which isn't for everybody. It's, it's um, Dr. Maurice Nicole and it's, uh, it goes very deep, but um, it's not a fairy story. But I read, um, as far as fairy stories, I read the first book of this, but you don't have to start with the first book. You can start with this. This is called The Princess and the Curdy, and this is Princess Leia. <laughs> and uh, we are all, uh, it might say it at the beginning of this book, kings and queens, princesses and princes, just like in um, the Narnia books, you know, once a king or queen of Narnia, always a king or queen of Narnia. So it's a gift. And don't forget that you have a high calling on your life. And all right, I won't talk more. I'll just show nature and then we can just enter into the book. We're starting at chapter one. Oh, good. Let me. There's a little bit of branches, but. And let's see if you if we can get the sun, because then you see movement of like time progresses, but then you'll just get the sun. So we'll just do this for now. And if Leia gets all better, then she'll entertain us. All right. The Princess and the Cardi by George MacDonald. This has been reproduced from a 1912 edition.
originally published in 1883 in London. So, okay, the first chapter is called The Mountain. I'm so excited for us. Um, This morning I heard a woman on a live video say, and like a woman that really encourages me in my life, say, oh, I, you know, she got in her spirit, you know, in her intuition, in her inner self, that she needs to go get a bunch of books on kings and queens, you know, and how to understand what it means that, you know, we have a high king. And, um, and it's funny because um, then Facebook reminded me of a George McDonald quote that I quoted seven years ago, I think, or six or more. I can't remember because it gave me two memories. And so I, I tweeted it this morning, not knowing I was going to start this book. And it says I got a notification right before this. It says, George McDonald liked your tweet. And I was like, that's so awesome. Like, it's so amazing. There's a person on Twitter that saw my tweet and his handle or her handle is George McDonald's. And they liked it. And then and so I was just prompted because I've been asking which book to start next because I have a few that I like, but I love this. So anyway, I just wanted to tell you the beautiful like synchronicities that happen that, that make these things happen, you know, so you can be aware of them and listen to them in your own life. All right. Chapter one, the mountain. Curdie was son. It's C-U-R-D-I-E is his name. Curdie. Curdie was the son of Peter the miner. He lived with his father and mother in a cottage built on a mountain, and he worked with his father inside the mountain. A mountain is a strange and awful thing. In old times, without knowing so much of their strangeness and awfulness as we do, people were yet more afraid of mountains, but then somehow they had not come to see how beautiful they are as well as awful and they hated them, and what people hate, they must fear. Wow. Wow. Look at the mountains around us. There's more behind me, but I'm not going to stand up right now because Leia's on my lap. Like really big ones. The Saddleback Mountains are behind me, if you want to know. I'm in Southern California. That's all I'll say because this is our secret spot for reading. There's people up behind me and they always take pictures of the whole panoramic. So I'm just going to let them be. I, I come underneath these bushes so that we can just be present. Anyway, I'll stay in the story. I had such a great perch. I have a, um, I have a holder now. I just forgot it on my walk because it's new for me to use a holder. All right. The wind might shake it a little bit. All right, so, so listen, okay, you don't have to listen. Here you are, you're here listening. So in the old times, without knowing so much of their strangeness and awfulness as we do, people were yet more afraid of mountains. But then somehow they had not come to see how beautiful they were as well as awful. And they hated them. What people hate, they must fear. Now that we have learned to look at them with admiration, perhaps we do not always feel quite awe enough of them. To me, they are beautiful terrors. You know, probably like the waves in the ocean. I will try to tell you what they are. They are portions of the heart of the earth that have escaped from the dungeon down below, and they've rushed up and out. For the heart of the earth is a great wallowing mass, not of blood, as in the hearts of men and animals, but of glowing, hot, melted metals and stones. Oh, I forgot to tell you, C.S. Lewis said every book that he ever read, I mean, he ever wrote, he quotes George MacDonald either directly or indirectly. So just so you know, he considers George MacDonald his master, his master teacher. And that just reminded me because this part of the book right here with the hot metals um, C.S. Lewis has in the book The Silver Chair when Prince Caspian's rescued 
and they, I mean, spoiler alert, when they go down um, in the depths, um, there's living rubies and living diamonds in the depths where, um, anyway, I won't go into that more, but it's in there. It's in the book, The Silver Chair. This reference from just right here, I can just feel it and read it or seeing it. So, hot melted metals and stones. As our hearts keep us alive, so the, that great lump of heat keeps the earth alive. It is a huge power of buried sunlight. That is what it is. Wow. Now think, out of that cauldron, where all the bubbles would be as big as the Alps, if it could get room for its boiling, certain bubbles have bubbled out and escaped up and away, and there they stand in the cool, cold sky, mountains. Think of the change, and you will no more wonder that there should be something awful about the very look of a mountain. From the darkness, for where the light has nothing to shine upon, it is much the same as darkness. Hmm. From the heat, from the endless tumult of boiling unrest, up with a sudden heavenward shoot into the wind and the cold and the star shine and a cloak of snow that lies like ermine above the blue-green mail of the glaciers. And the great sun, their grandfather up there in the sky, and their little old cold aunt, the moon, that comes wandering about the house at night, an everlasting stillness, except for the wind that turns the rocks and caverns into a roaring organ for the young archangels that are studying how to let out the pent-up praises of their hearts. And the molten music of the streams rushing ever from the bosoms of the glaciers fresh born. Think too of the change in their own substance, no longer molten and soft, having the glowing but hard and shining, oh, heaving, no, no longer, sorry, no longer molten and soft, heaving and glowing, but hard and shining and cold. Think of the creatures scampering over and burrowing in it, and the birds building up their nests upon it, and the trees growing out of its sides like hair to clothe it, and the lovely grass in the valleys, and the gracious flowers, even at the very edge of its armored ice, like the rich embroidery of the garment below, and the rivers galloping down the valleys in a tumult of white and green. And along with these, think of the terrible precipices down which the traveler may fall and be lost, and the frightful gulfs of blue air cracked in the glaciers, and the dark, profound lakes covered like little arctic oceans with floating lumps of ice. All this outside the mountain, but the inside, who shall tell what lies there? Caverns of awfulest solitude, their walls miles thick, sparkling with ores of gold or silver, copper or iron, tin or mercury, studded perhaps with precious stones, perhaps a brook. Come here. I'll put her in the picture for a little bit. And I gotta shelter her from the sun. Um, perhaps a oh, precious stones, perhaps a brook with eyeless fish in it, running, running ceaselessly, cold and babbling, through banks crusted with carbuncles and golden topazes, or over a gravel of which some of the stones are rubies and emeralds, perhaps diamonds and sapphires. Who can tell? And whoever can't tell is free to think, all waiting to flash, waiting for millions of ages, ever since the earth flew off from the sun, a great blot of fire and began to cool. There are caverns full of water, numbing cold, fiercely hot, hotter than any boiling water. From some of these, the water cannot get out and from others, it runs in channels as the blood in the body. Little veins bring it down from the ice above into the great caverns of the mountain's heart, whence the arteries let it out again, gushing in pipes and clefts and ducts of all shapes and sizes. Through and through its bulk until it springs newborn 
to the light and rushes down the mountainside in torrents and down the valleys in rivers, down, down, rejoicing to the mighty lungs of the world. That is the sea, where it is tossed in storms and cyclones, heaved up in billows, twisted in water spouts, dashed to mist upon rocks, beaten by millions of tails, and breathed by millions of gills. Whence at last, melted into vapor by the sun, it is lifted up pure into the air and borne by the servant winds back to the mountain tops and the snow, the solid ice and the molten stream. Some of us, I'm just going to say real quick, one other side is that some of us, um, you might need to fast from social media and from your phones and from TV, um, or this can be your ease into fasting. Um, or your time when you are fasting because sometimes just sitting and hearing a book is a lot slower than we're used to going we're used to getting fed and fed and fed and dopamine highs in little bursts of visuals and so this might seem really boring at first but just sit through the boringness of it you know the beginning where he talks about the mountain a lot is just um it used to be boring to me now i'm just loving it so much but i'm just recalling how it used to be boring and so I encourage you to sit through whatever boringness you might feel in the moment and and just know that you're going to get so much out of the reading, out of this book, out of being present in it. There's a little bee right, right here, right below where the camera is. You'll see him flying around. But my friend in England was writing today that he didn't see any bees in his garden. And so it's like a, we're, I don't know, there's, it just, everything flows together. We're so lucky that, um, <sighs> hi, honey, hi, that we have nature and, and that we can be in it still and that this earth is still working, you know? working anyway it's like we can be happy every day that we are above the ground and the ground is not above us that's what a friend said all right so heaved up in billows twisted in water spouts dashed to mist upon rocks beaten by millions of tails and breathed by millions of gills, whence at last melted into vapor by the sun, it is lifted up pure into the air and borne by the servant winds back to the mountain tops and the snow, the solid ice and the molten stream. Yeah, okay. It went from, um, it went from down the valleys and rivers, down rejoicing into the mighty lungs of the world. That is the sea, where it is tossed in storms and cyclones, heaved up in billows, twisted in water spouts, dashed to the mist upon the rocks, beaten by millions of tails and breathed by millions of gills. Whence at last, melted into vapor by the sun, it is lifted up pure into the air and borne by the servant winds back to the mountain tops and the snow, the solid ice and the molten stream. It just goes in this cycle, you know? Well, when the heat of the earth has thus come rushing among her children, bringing with it gifts of all she possesses, then straightway into it rush her children to see what they can find there, with pickaxe and spade and crowbar, with boring, a boring chisel and blasting powder, they force their way back, as it is to search for what toys they may have left in their long forgotten nurseries. Hence the mountains that lift their heads into the clear air and are dotted over with the dwellings of men are tunneled and bored in the darkness of their bosoms by the dweller in the houses which they hold up to the sun and air. Curdie and his father were of these. Their business was to bring to light hidden things. They sought silver in the rock and found it and carried it out. Of the many other precious things in their mountains, they knew little or nothing. Silver ore was what they were sent to find, 
and in darkness and danger they found it. But oh, how sweet was the air on the mountain face when they came out at sunset to go home to wife and mother. They did breathe deep then. The miners belonged to the king of the country, and the miners were his servants, working under his overseers and officers. By servants they were paid, you know, but they were servants of the king. He was a real king, that is, one who ruled for the good of his people and not to please himself. And he wanted the silver not to buy rich things for himself, but to help him to govern the country and pay the armies that defended it from certain troublesome neighbors and the judges whom he set to portion out righteousness amongst the people so that they might learn it themselves and come to do without judges at all. Nothing that could be got from the heart of the earth could have been put to better purposes than the silver that the king's miners got for him. There were people in the country who, when it came into their he hands, degraded it by locking it up in a chest, and then it grew, it grew diseased and was called mammon. You know, it's like um, the root of the love of mammon. That's that word. The love of mammon is the root of all evil, of, of storing up these things in a chest where they're, they're not, you know, too much has, much has been given um, much is required. I was getting that in my intuition on my walk up here. I was like, why are we getting to do this? And, and I just feel so, um, so richly blessed in my life, uh, not to use that word in a cheesy way or anything, but, and so when you're given this many riches, this, these riches of the kingdom, you want to give them away so that other people have access to them. Just like if you had a bunch of wealth and you could do good with it, you know, just like this king is doing good with this and not making it mammon. So it says, there were people in the country who when it came into their hands, degraded it by locking it up in a chest and then it grew diseased and was called mammon and bred all sorts of quarrels. But when first it left the king's hands, it never made any but friends and the air of the world kept it clean. You know, it kept being circulated. It's just like, as you get this, you can share it with someone else, you know, as it benefits you in your life, you can give it to other people. So it can, I mean, I've had so many dark times where just a little bit of a story or a song came to me and it got me through to just remember to keep pressing on and, and be enheartened, be, have love in your heart for the next day. That's a gift to us, you know. So about a year before this story began, a series of very remarkable events had just ended. I will narrate as much of them as will serve to show the tops of the roots of my tree. We're just seeing the tops of the roots of the tree. Upon the mountain, on one of its many claws, stood a grand old house, half farmhouse, half castle, belonging to the king. And there, his only child, the princess, Irene, had been brought up till she was nearly nine years old, and would doubtless have continued much longer, but for the strange events to which I have referred. At that time, the hollow places of the mountain were inhabited by creatures called goblins, who for various reasons and in various ways made themselves troublesome to all, but to the little princess, dangerous, mainly by the watchful devotion and energy of Curdy, this boy Curdy, however, their designs had been utterly defeated and made to recoil upon themselves to their own destruction, so that now there were very few of them left alive, and the miners did not believe there was a single goblin remaining inside the whole inside, wait, remaining in the whole inside of the mountain. The king had been so pleased with the boy that then approaching 13 years of age, when he carried away his daughter, he asked him to accompany them, but he was still better pleased with him when he found that he preferred staying with his father and mother. He was a right good king and knew that the love of a boy who would not leave his father and mother to be made a great man was worth 10,000 offers to die for his sake and would prove so when the right time came, that he was noble for doing that. For his father and mother, they would have given him up without a grumble. His, okay, so Curdie's father and mother, they would have given him up without a grumble, for they were just as good as the king, and he and they perfectly understood each other. But in this matter, 
not seeing that he could do anything for the king, which one of his numerous attendants could not do as well, Curdy felt that it was for him to decide. So the king took a kind farewell of them all and rode away with his daughter on his horse before him. A gloom fell upon the mountain and the miners when she was gone. Oh. And Curdy did not whistle for a whole week. Oh, he loved the princess, like they loved each other. Anyway, as for his verses, there was no occasion to make any now. He was always making up new ones. He said they scare off the goblins when you make up new verses, you know, on the spot, like new songs. He had made them only to drive away the goblins, and they were all gone, a good riddance. Only the princess was gone too. He would rather have had things as they were, except for the princess's sake. But whoever is diligent will soon be cheerful. And though the miners missed the household of the castle, they yet managed to get on without them. Peter and his wife, however, were troubled with the fancy that they had stood in the way of their boy's good fortune. It would have been such a fine thing for him and them too, they thought, if he had ridden with the good king's train. How beautiful he looked, they said, when he rode the king's own horse through the river that the goblins had sent out of the hill. He might soon have been a captain, they did believe. The good, kind people did not reflect that the road to the next duty is the only straight one, or that for their fancied good, we should never wish our children or friends to do what we would not do ourselves if we were in that their position. We must accept righteous sacrifices as well as make them. Chapter two, the white pigeon. When in the winter they had had their supper and sat about the fire, or when in the summer they lay on the border of the rock margin stream that ran through their little meadow close by the door of their cottage, issuing from the far up whiteness, often folded in clouds. Curdie's mother would not seldom lead the conversation to one pecu peculiar personage, said and believed to have been much concerned in the late issues of events. That personage was the great-great-grandmother of the princess, of whom the princess had often talked, but whom neither Curdie nor his mother had ever seen. Well, anyway. Curdie could indeed remember, although already it looked more like a dream than he could account for it had really taken place, how the princess had once led him up many stairs to what she called a beautiful room in the top of the tower where she went through all the, what should he call it? The behavior of presenting him to her grandmother, talking now to her and now to him, while all the time he saw nothing but a bare garret, a heap of musty straw, a sunbeam and a withered apple. Lady, he would have declared before the king him, himself, young or old, there was none except the princess herself, who was certainly vexed that he could not see what she at least believed she saw. And for his mother, she had once seen, long before Curdie was born, a certain mysterious light of the same description with one Irene spoke of, calling it her grandmother's moon. And Curdie himself had seen this same light shining above the castle just as the king and the princess were taking their leave. Since that time, neither had seen nor heard anything that could be supposed connected with her. Strangely enough, however, nobody had seen her go away. This great-great-grandmother, you know. If she was such an old lady, she could hardly be supposed to have set out alone and on foot when all the house was asleep. Still, away she must have gone, for of course, if she was so powerful, she would always be about the princess to take care of her. But as Curdie grew older, he doubted more and more whether Irene had not been talking of some dream she had taken for reality. He had heard it said that children could not always distinguish betwixt dreams and actual events. At the same time, there was his mother's testimony. What was he to do with that? His mother, through whom he had learned everything, could hardly be imagined by her own dutiful son to have mistaken a dream for a fact of the waking world. 
So he rather shrunk from thinking about it. And the less he thought about it, the less he was inclined to believe it when he did think about it. And therefore, of course, the less inclined to talk about it to his father and mother. For although his father was one of those men who for one word, they say, think 20 thoughts, Curdie was well assured that he would rather doubt his own eyes than his wife's testimony. What a beautiful husband. Anyway, there were no others to whom he could have talked about it. The miners were a mingled company, some good and some not so good, some rather bad. None of them so bad or so good as they might have been. Curry liked most of them and was a favorite with all, but they knew very little about the upper world and what might or might not take place there. They knew silver from copper ore. They understood the underground ways of thinking. I mean, the, the underground ways of things. And they could look very wise with their lanterns in their hands, searching after this or that sign of ore, or for some mark to guide their way in the hollows of the earth. But as to the great-great-grandmothers, they would have mocked him all the rest of his life for the absurdity of not being absolutely certain that the solemn belief of his father and mother was nothing but ridiculous nonsense. Why, to them, the very word great-great-grandmother would have been a week's laughter. And I'm not sure that they were able quite to believe that there were such persons as great-great-grandmothers. They had never seen one. They were not companions to give the best of help towards progress. And as Curdie grew, he grew at this time faster in body than in mind, with the usual consequence that he was getting rather stupid. One of the chief signs of which was that he believed less and less of the things he had never seen. And at the same time, I do not think he was ever so stupid as to imagine that this was a sign of superior faculty and strength of mind. Still, he was becoming more and more a miner and less and less a man of the upper world where the wind blew. On his way to the mine, he took less and less notice of the bees. Ah, I didn't know they were talking about the bees, George MacDonald was, and the butterflies. I saw a butterfly right as I was starting this. It almost landed on my finger. Uh, moths and dragonflies, the flowers and the brooks and the clouds. He was gradually changing into a commonplace man. There is this difference between the growth of some human beings and that of others. In the one case, it, a, is it, a, it is a continuous dying. In the other, a continuous resurrection. One of the latter sort comes at length to know at once whether a thing is true the moment it comes before him. One of the former class grows more and more afraid of being taken in, and so afraid of it that he takes himself in altogether and comes at length to believe in nothing but his dinner. This is the dwarfs in the last battle of C.S. Lewis's book. They, they keep saying we don't want to be taken in. It's, Anyway, to be sure of a thing with him is to have it between his teeth with those people, you know. Curdy was not in a very good way then at that time. His father and mother had, it is true, no fault to find with him. And yet, yet neither of them was ready to sing when they, the thought of him came up. There must be something wrong when a mother catches herself sighing over the time when her boy was in petticoats. Here's the, here's the picture. Hopefully I can have time to take a picture and put it on here, but we'll see. Or the father looks sad when he thinks of how he used to carry him on his shoulder. The boy should enclose and keep as his life the, the old child at the heart of him and never let it go. He must still, to be a right man, be his mother's darling and more, his father's pride and more. The child is not meant to die, but to be forever fresh born. Curdy had made himself a bow and some arrows and was teaching himself to shoot with them. One evening in the early summer, as he was walking home from the mine with them in his hand, a light flashed across his eyes. He looked and there was a snow white pigeon settling on a rock in front of him in the red light of the level sun. There it fell at once to work with one of its wings in which a feather or two had gotten some sprays twisted causing a certain roughness unpleasant to the fastidious creature of the air. It was indeed a lovely being, 
and Curdie thought how happy it must be, flitting through the air with a flash, a live bolt of light. For a moment he became so one with the bird that he seemed to feel both its bill and its feathers. As the one adjusted to the other to fly again, and his heart swelled with the pleasure of its involuntary sympathy. Another moment, and it would have been aloft in the waves of rosy light. It was just bending its little legs to spring. That moment it fell on the path, broken-winged and bleeding from Curdie's cruel arrow. With a gush of pride at his skill and pleasure at its success, he ran to pick up his prey. I must say for him, he picked it up gently. Perhaps it was the beginning of his repentance. But when he had the white thing in his hand, when he had the white thing in his hands, its whiteness stained with another red than that of the sunset flood in which it had just been reveling. Oh, God, who knows the joy of a bird? He's saying, you know, to God, you know. The bird, the ecstasy of a creature that has neither storehouse nor barn, when he held it, I say, in his victorious hands, the winged thing looked up in his face and with such eyes, asking, what was the matter? And where the red sun had gone, and the clouds and the wind of its flight? Then they closed, but to open again presently, with the same questions in them. And so they closed and opened several times. But always when they opened, their look was fixed on his, on his gaze, you know. It did not once flutter or try to get away. It only throbbed and bled and looked at him. Curdie's heart began to grow very large in his bosom. What could it mean? It was nothing but a pigeon. And why should he not kill a pigeon? But the fact was that not till that very moment had he ever known what a pigeon was. A good many discoveries of a similar kind have been made by most of us. Once more, it opened his eyes, then closed them again and its throbbing ceased. Cardi gave a sob. Its last look reminded him of the princess. He did not know why. He remembered how hard he had labored to set her beyond danger, and yet what dangers she had had to encounter for his sake. They had been saviors to each other. And what had he done now? He had stopped saving and he had begun killing. What had he been sent into the world for? Surely not to be a death to its joy and loveliness. He had done the thing that was contrary to gladness. He was a destroyer. He was not the curdy he had been meant to be. Then the underground waters gushed from the boy's heart, and with tears came the remembrance that a white pigeon, just before the princess went away with her father, came from somewhere, yes, from the grandmother's lamp, and flew around the king and Irene, and himself, and then flown away. This might be that very pigeon, horrible to think, and if it wasn't yet, it was a white pigeon, the same as it, and she kept a great many pigeons and white ones, as Irene had told him. Then whose pigeon he could he have killed but the grand old princesses? Suddenly everything round about him seemed against him. The red sunset stung him, the rocks frowned at him, the sweet wind that had been la la laving his face as he walked up the hill dropped as if it it, he wasn't fit to be kissed anymore, you know, by the wind. Was the whole world going to cast him out? Would he have to stand there forever, not knowing what to do with the dead pigeon in his hand? Things looked bad indeed. Was the whole world going to make a work about a pigeon, a white pigeon? The sun went down, great clouds gathered over the west and shortened the twilight. The wind gave a howl and then they lay down again. The clouds gathered thicker. Then came a rumbling. He thought it was thunder. It was a rock that fell inside the mountain. A goat ran past him down the hill, followed by a dog sent to fetch him home. He thought they were goblin creatures and trembled. He used to despise them and still, he held the dead pigeon tenderly in his hand. It grew darker and darker. An evil something began to move in his heart. What a fool I am, he said in himself. Then he grew angry and was just going to throw the bird from him and whistle when a brightness shone all around him. He lifted his eyes and saw a great globe of light like silver at the hottest heat. He had once seen silver run from the furnace. It shone from somewhere above the roofs of the castle. It must be the great old princess's moon. 
How could she be there? Of course she was not there. He had asked the whole household and nobody knew anything about her or her globe either. It couldn't be. And yet, what did that signify? That there was the white globe shining and here was the dead white bird in his hand. That moment, the pigeon gave a flutter. It's not dead, cried Curdy, almost with a shriek. The same instant he was running full speed toward the castle, never letting his heels down, lest he should shake the poor wounded bird. All right, I have something to go to, so I only had 45 minutes. I wish you so much love. We'll start on chapter three next time. Share, and thanks for being here.